Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> this is Brother Smith from First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And greetings to everyone in the name of the Father and His precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, appreciate the Lord very much today, and I appreciate the time that we're living in. It's a precious time to, to be uh, alive and aware of the, the work of God and what God's doing, be a part of his saints and uh, his body. And uh, so <clears throat> I realize there's a Several things going on today in this world that we're living in, but uh, this is our day. And, you know, this is where we are, and we need to be grateful and thankful uh, that we're here and that the Lord has blessed us the way that he has, and uh, uh, that we're able to be a part of, not only of the Lord's work, but a part of experiencing what what's going on in this world. We're, we're in this world, just like Jesus told his disciples. He said, you're not of this world, but you're in it. And he prayed to the Father that God would keep them. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure that the Lord is asking his Father, uh, as well as he himself is trying to keep us and help us in our day, in our hour that we're living in. And so it's interesting to, uh, you know, to know uh, what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about having a knowledge of what's going on in the world. We have such a, uh, a technological world where media is so, um, tremendous that we're a well well aware of almost everything you know that's going on in the world. It's it's almost amazing that uh, you know we're we're able to you know I mean if somebody gets killed in Bangladesh we hear about it. No matter where in the world something goes on, we have information today that we know about it. And uh, that's different than the world's before us. It's just like this pandemic that we're living uh, in. Uh, what's transpiring here, you know, many years ago, there wouldn't have been uh, the type of media, the type of knowledge put out in such a rapid pace that we would have even been aware of what was going on. Uh, I am thankful that even though the United States is uh, it's a large country, so we've had uh, now over 100,000 deaths. However, there's 358 million people, I believe it is, if I'm not mistaken, in the United States. And so uh, the amount of deaths we've had has been, uh, and in, in any death is, is horrible, but, you know, uh, there's all kinds of diseases and things that's brought this about. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say about that is, is that I do feel like that we're fortunate that it, that being a, a pandemic or world um, uh, virus, if I, I guess that's what it is, uh, I'm not a medical professional, so I have to leave it up to them, but... Uh, you know, we've been fortunate, <clears throat> especially here in Arkansas. We've had just a little over 100 deaths, and about half of them have been in correctional facilities and nursing homes. And so with the, the, with the population we've had, it's very, very small. What we've underwent here compared to some other states that we're certainly praying for as well as our own state. But anyway, uh, I feel like God's going to get us through this. There will be some good things come out of it. They will develop, you know, and and uh, we've got medical uh, technology today that uh, 
rapidly can deal with just about anything. It, you know, with, if you remember when <clears throat> some of these other diseases came in, some of them seemed like they were incurable and uh, are, you know, hard to even treat, but now they've got treatments, they've spared lives and uh, that they didn't know they could spare at the time. So uh, I know God will get his people through it. You know, I remember, you remember in the Bible when, uh, when God's hand was on Joseph and sent him uh, by his brothers, it was a, it was a, uh, an evil that they uh, committed, but it was, God's hand was in it to send Joseph to Egypt uh, prior to the, the great famine that hit. And uh, God was able through Joseph, uh, what he did uh, to bring uh, uh, Joseph's family, Jacob and uh, his, his children uh, uh, to, um, to Egypt. Uh, to make a way for them. Of course, God's hand was in all of that because God could have stopped the famine. He didn't. There didn't have to be a famine. God's in control, so He could have. He could have worked that out. That wouldn't have been a problem for the Lord. But that was part of God's plan <clears throat> to have those people. Uh, if you remember, God told uh, <clears throat> Abraham that they were going to be slaves and they were going to be under bondage for over 400 years. That was prophesied. The Lord told him that way before it happened. So all of this was in part of God's plan, but even at the same time, look, God had a plan to put that those souls into Egypt and let them stay there and multiply. And uh, while they were while they were multiplying where God could make a nation out of them, he humbled them. He, done, he didn't just humble them uh, in Egypt, but he humbled them after he took them out of Egypt and took them through the wilderness. Uh, he took them through a humbling process. Uh, he never dealt with another people like that, like those people. And, uh, but that was all of God's plan to form what he was doing so we don't know necessarily right now what God is doing, uh, but we're his children. If you remember the, the, the uh, children of God, Abraham's offspring, when they went to Goshen, when, when Joseph, God put him in such a place that his whole family went to Goshen which was a fertile area, and they had, you know, their flocks, they had their cattle, uh, and they were, they were put in a perfect place for them, and God took care of them. There was light down in Goshen. God, God's blessing was on his people during a rough time, so I think we ought to consider that whatever's going on in this world today, if we're God's children and we're serving God and we're fitted into his purpose. That's important today, saints of God. It's important that, that you uh, stay assured that you are working with the Lord and that you're fitting in his purpose, that you're being favored by God. Remember Jesus, he said that in, in the, uh, I believe it's in the, either the 15th or 17th chapter of St. John, when he said uh, uh, concerning his disciples, uh, he said, even as I have uh, uh, abide, even as I have abode in your love, he was talking to his father, uh, and he prayed that they would abide in his love so that uh, in other words, that he was in God's favor because he abode. He said, I kept my father's commandments and abode as I abode in your love. I pray that they'll keep my commandments and that they will abide in my love just as I, I, I abode in yours. Well, that tells you that God's 
that if we abide, if we will keep his commandments, if we'll strive to serve God and win his favor, you say, well, you know, you know, do I have to win the Lord's favor? Sure, you have to win his favor. Sure, you have to, uh, you have to be careful to make sure that you're pleasing God and that you're uh, learning his righteousness and letting his hand direct and guide your life. And uh, it, when it pleases God, uh, he, he protects you. God's covering is over you. God can lift that off of you. Uh, if, you know, if we're too disobedient, uh, our disobedience, after you grow so much in the Lord, your, you, your disobedience uh, shouldn't be uh, lip, uh, deliberate. You know, there's some things we can get into, like, you know, like for an example, um, when the Lord, one of the letters that he wrote uh, had John write to the first uh, church of Ephesus there, the first church he mentioned to have that letter wrote there. One of the things he told them, they less left their first love. And it, it's almost like, you know, they were in some way lacking of the knowledge that they had left their first love. Let me say something about that. Uh, these seven churches of Asia, uh, I'm, I've been for a long time. Uh, I'll have to say that the Lord is, uh, the Lord is, has uh, dealt with me uh, concerning the book of Revelation now over 25 years. And I know I know that God has dealt with me. It's just like there's other ministers, that there's other subjects, there's other doctrines, there's other, you know, every, we don't all have the same gifts. And I didn't know God was going to do that with me, but the Lord did. The Lord began to deal with me, wake me up in the middle of the night. Sometimes I would get up in the, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning and the God, God of heaven would be dealing with me about the book of Revelation. And I, I didn't, it wasn't something that I was stirred up about or reading or even studying, but God would stir me up. And, uh, you know, I said I wasn't stirred up about it, but I was after God began to deal with me. And um, I can remember times when I'd get up one or two o'clock in the morning and go into the kitchen. And at that time, I didn't have a study. And uh, so I'd go into the kitchen, turn on the kitchen light and re start to read my Bible. And I remember a few times when I was there the rest of that night, all that day, into the next night, and seeing the daylight of the next day of God dealing with me, and you know I couldn't leave it, and uh, and so and then you know there's things that would just come to me. Uh, sometimes it would take years, just one part of the book, uh, and my uh, my understanding would open on a certain part. And that's happened over a period of years. It's kind of like a puzzle, like a big jigsaw puzzle being put together. I, there's not any other book. There's not any real reason that I've had a greater interest in that book than any other part of the Bible, except for the fact that God has dealt with me about it. Uh, after you've been a minister for so many years, you begin to learn when God's dealing with you. Not just, you know, that the Lord... Uh, you know, or that you have an interest or you study something out, but it's not only that, it, it's God can be dealing with you, not even with the word of God, but something having to do with something else in your life or some of the saints or your church or if you're a pastor, <clears throat> you know, and so I've learned the voice of the Lord to, to an extent. Uh, Anyway, it's just a little bit of a backdrop. And the reason I'm saying that is because I've been planning for some time now to write a book uh, explaining my present position on the book of Revelation. I don't claim, in fact, it's, it, you know, it sounds maybe exalted, but I, I hope God knows that I'm not exalted about it. I don't feel like I am, but, you know, uh, uh, I just would like to, I feel like I have a 
understanding of the book, at least on what I presently see and understand in the book. And I, I, I feel uh, that the Lord would like for me to share that, especially with the younger brethren and, and with brethren that that's not necessarily been their forte to speak of and uh, that I would leave, leave a platform of something for people to, to study about. One of my hangups, <laughs> I'll just be honest about it, I, uh, I have, I feel like I could write for some time from the fourth chapter forward uh, to the 22nd chapter where I've been, ha my hang up has been the, set, the letter to the seven churches of Asia. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. Is because those letters, I'm convinced that those letters were written for the present time 2,000 years ago in the end of the Jewish world. I'm convinced that those letters that John received the revelation before AD 70. I know that uh, theology through the Catholic Church um, put the, the, the date of writing in AD 95 or 96. I think that's impossible. And I'll, I'll, I can tell you why, but I don't know how many of you are all that interested in it. But anyway, it's important. It's important if you're going to learn about the book. Um, the reason that I feel like it's impossible, number one, the, the church had already fell away way before AD 95 or 96. The, um, the, um, there wasn't, you can't find anything in research of, of in the nineties that took place AD after the death of Christ after the church fell away and the destruction of the temple in AD 70, you can't find anything uh, in history about that. And, uh, and, and it's because if you, uh, if you look at the first chapter and I'm, you know, I feel uh, okay to mention this on Thursday nights because I've been dealing with the condition of the end of the world, end of our world and the Gentile world, explaining why we're not in the end yet. We're not in the last prophetical hour yet. And there's a lot of things that has to take place. However, we are down in the end close. We don't have too many years left being in the end of a 2000 year period. And so uh, I think it's important for us to look into the future at times. And I think there's men that have prophetical gifts that uh, God's dealt with that can help explain prophecy uh, just like I think there's other men that can explain other parts in the Bible uh, because that's their gift. And, uh, but in the book of Revelation, if you look at the very first verse in the very first chapter, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto him, show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and read the next two verses because uh, it goes with this. It said, who bear, who bear record, John, he bear record of the word of God and, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Verse three said, blessed is he that readeth and they that heareth the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now there's some people, there is a teaching out there that teaches the whole book of Revelation was fulfilled back there in the end of the Jewish world in the early church. I don't think that's possible either because I think the book bears it out that that's not but when you start out reading these first three verses, it does tell you God gave Jesus a revelation. He sent his angel to show it to his servant John, things which must shortly come to pass. It's been 2,000 years since then, saints. It's not talk, this has not been a short time. And he said, blessed are they that readeth 
and that hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written therein for the time is at hand. What time is at hand? Well, it was time to write the letter to the seven churches. Why? Uh, number one, uh, who, uh, why, there was a lot more than seven churches in Asia. Why are these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea? Those seven churches is who these letters were written to. Uh, why was it just written to those seven churches? We do not have a biblical answer to answer that. But I think there's some reasonable, uh, I think you can reason some with why. Uh, I, <clears throat> you could consider that the seven, the word, the number seven is a perfect number. It's a complete number. And that maybe these seven letters represent the whole or the all of uh, those churches in Asia. But I don't think that's, I don't think that's what it is. And the reason is, is because some of the letters are repetitious that with some of the things that's in them that was sent to some of the other letters. Plus, um, there's a difference uh, that God's dealing with these churches seems to be individually uh, addressed to those churches. However, uh, another thing I think is reasonable, number one, these were very lucrative areas. Main roads went through these areas when you went into Asia out of, uh, uh, out of Greece or out of Italy. And, and when, you, when you went into those areas, you, those main roads, you'd find these seven churches pretty uh, in a pretty much nucleus going into Asia and out of there into other areas. Uh, it's very possible that these were like leading or mother churches uh, that oversaw uh, the other churches, they were all out of the work of, of the Apostle Paul. And, uh, you know, so those churches were tied together. So it's very possible that those main churches that oversaw other churches, that everyone would get the letter. In fact, I think all seven churches not, over, not only got all seven letters, but they got the whole book of Revelation. They got the whole revelation that was given. Now, here's why I don't feel like that it was written and fulfilled back there. Because he's telling him them to write, this is urgent. Think about it. Jesus Christ himself is dictating seven letters that he didn't dictate of any of the New Testament epistles or the writings of the New Testament. He did not personally dictate any of that. They were, those men were led of God. They were the led of the spirit of God. There's no question about that. But he's personally sent an angel to dictate these letters to these seven churches. Uh, there was something emphatic about that. There was something important about that. There was something that was shortly to come to pass that he wanted them to know about. And there was something that was at hand right there. It was upon them. And I, I feel certain that it was AD 70. Uh, there are several reasons why. Let me just say a little bit about it. It'll just help you with a backdrop uh, or platform uh, understanding. Uh, number one, see in AD 95 or 96, when this historian, Catholic historian Eusebius, who lived in the oh, 300 AD, and he was quoting from the writings of Irenaeus, who lived in the oh, 100, uh, 100, I can't remember the exact dates, but in, in a couple hundred years apart. And um, he, uh, it seemed that some of his knowledge came from Polycarp, the bishop of, of Ephesus. Uh, but 
nevertheless, it's all hearsay, and it's it, these are these are Catholic historians that are quoting one another. Eusebius is quoting Irenaeus, and what he has to say about it's really ambiguous. It's just hard to. Uh, he just makes a statement that uh, the number of the name of the Antichrist. If we were to know the number, he says he that wrote it would have certainly told us if it was important. And he said, uh, and he made a statement somewhere in those statements where he said for the time, uh, uh, it was nearly at our time. Well, he's quoting Irenaeus. So that's why they're thinking it had to be not too long after Irenaeus' time or his writing. However, in another writing, he called the book of Revelation ancient transcripts, you know, from, for him, it was ancient. So it's pretty ambiguous to even put a, any kind of date on that. Uh, here's why I don't agree with that. Number one, if you look in the first, first chapter again of Revelation in the 19th verse, I want you to see how he ends this, this up before he quotes the letters, what he tells John. He said, uh, let's, start in, uh, uh, let's start in the 17th verse. John said, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Uh, I'm going to just quickly, I want to say something about that. A little bit later here in the, the uh, sixth chapter, he gives us seals and, it, and he shows that the rider of the pale horse was death and the hell followed after it. So in using the same book of prophecy of, of what death and hell is, death was a ministry and a fallen religious condition that could not uh, produce life. It, there was no anointing or life of God in the words or in the teachings or in the doctrines or the mannerism of that ministry. That was death that was riding the horse. It couldn't produce life. There wasn't an anointed uh, anointing of God's spirit to give life to the words. And then hell followed with it. That's talking about a religious hell, a hellish condition of a man-made religious system. And so, but here Jesus is telling him, I've got the keys to hell and of death. I can unlock that. I can, I can uh, free that condition that's on the earth. And, and with the church already in a falling condition, you remember the Apostle Paul told the disciples at Ephesus, he said, after my departure, he told them, he said, you won't see my face anymore. After he met with them, he said, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, spoiling the flock. Men of your own selves, arise up making disciples of them own selves. He began to show how iniquity was working. Uh, he showed in his letter to the Thessalonians and Thessalonia that Iniquity was already working and uh, the falling away was coming. And so uh, this condition now, John, here he is, uh, he's uh, exiled, supposedly. We don't have any absolute proof, but it looks like that's true, that he's exiled to the island of Patmos, which I used to think that this was a uh, uninhabited island that he was, you know, uh, taken to and exiled and put there, you know, just to rough it and make his own. It's not true. If you study it out, you'll find out that that uh, Patmos was a very uh, lucrative, lucrative, very populated island. The thing was, when a Roman emperor, a Caesar, uh, exiled someone under Roman law, they were put in a city. Uh, they were put in a locale, an area, and they were to stay there. And if they, and as long as they stayed there, they could they could live there. But if they left there, once the 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 uh, 
uh, emperor found out about, they would kill them. That was their punishment, was death. But if they'd stay in the city, and it was to keep them in that area, to keep them from doing whatever they was doing. Of course, the apostle John was was uh, uh, propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. And in exiling him, that was a way to shut him up and stop him from going areas. And, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, that was a way to stop him. Now, there was a law uh, that when an emperor exiled somebody to a certain area, it had to do with that emperor's desires. But when the emperor died, <clears throat> that freed the person that was exiled if they were still alive. They were free and no longer under that law. Well, <clears throat> Nero was a very cruel uh, emperor concerning uh, Christendom. Concerning the body of Christ, he was a very fierce persecutor of the church of the body of Jesus Christ. He was hard on the saints of God. So was Domitian, which was a couple of emperors later in AD 95 that, um, that was also uh, very hard on the people of God. He was, he was a rough emperor. But here's the thing. Nero died in AD 68. And, that, and, and history shows us that John left Patmos and went back to Ephesus uh, it's it's also uh, some history to the fact that Mary, Jesus' mother, was still there. And that uh, John, you know, he took care of her. He, the Lord put her in his hands. But anyway, John went back to Ephesus and there died. That's what history shows about John. Well, number one, if he was exiled, how did he get out of there? Well, if Nero died in AD 68, that freed John to go back to Ephesus. That's number one. Number two, um, uh, John wrote this in Patmos. It starts out telling us that. So he would have received the revelation before, if it was during the time of Nero, it would have been probably in AD 67 or 68. So it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have been, it would have been very shortly before AD 70. And if the Lord was trying to show what, what was going to take place. Now look what he says here. Let's, let's read on a little bit more in the 19th verse, the verse I want you to get. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. That's talking about the future. So I told you my hangup had been in the letter to the seven churches. And here's why. It's because it seems very clear to me that these letters to the seven churches were not only admonishments, some uh, recognition for the works of righteousness of those churches, uh, commending them for holding fast to his name or uh, for their works of righteousness. But at the same time, he was correcting specific things that needed to be corrected. And if you'll notice, there were seven stars in his hand. Those stars were the, were the angels or the bishops, messengers to each one of these seven churches. And there were seven candlesticks, which it says are the seven. Let's read verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, <clears throat> Jesus was walking in this vision. He was walking in the midst of the seven churches or the seven candlesticks. The churches are called candlesticks. Now let's, let's talk about that just a moment here. Number one, the candlestick was in the holy place. The holy place, the, you know, the temple or the tabernacle, whichever you want to look at it's a picture, the outer court was the gate, 
the, the brazen altar, the laver, and then the priest, of course, he would offer up sacrifices on the brazen, brazen altar. He'd go cleanse himself, wash himself at the laver, and then he would change garments from the woolen garment to a linen garment, representing righteousness. When he washed himself, he was, that represented washing himself with the, uh, with the water of the word by the spirit of God, and then he would have to change clothes. That, there's a picture in that. You and I have to go through that process. We have to go through the brazen offer of offering up our sacrifice of the works of the flesh. We have to mortify the deeds of the flesh by the spirit through repentance, through baptism. Uh, then we have to go through the labor. We have to be washed by the water of the word and the spirit of God. And we'll have to go through a, a garment change. We'll have to get out of the fleshly woolen garment into a white linen garment, which represents the righteousness of the saints for us to go into the holy place. The holy place was second heaven. First heaven was the, was the outer courts. And so uh, we're here we are now. I mean, I mean, second heaven has to become available. Well, we, we, it's not available yet. We're, that's a restored church condition. That's where the seven golden candlestick is. That's where uh, the 12 loaves of unleavened bread, that's, that's what we're working on. The 12 apostles doctrine sitting on a table that has four legs that has the four major doctrines. Remember the four major doctrines, the, the doctrine of, of baptisms, the, the doctrine of laying on of hands, the doctrine of resurrections, and eternal judgments. Those are the four major doctrines of the Bible. And there's four legs that holds up the table, the 12 loaves of unleavened bread. Unleavened means there's no guile, no falsehood, no, you know, leaven puffs up. But the truth of the word of God doesn't have nothing. It's, it, it doesn't have anything that puffs it up. It's the sincere word of truth. It's the truth of God's word. And those 12 apostles had it. The, 12, the, uh, the, the uh, doctrine of the 12 apostles. We're still trying to get that. We're still trying to get that restored. That's a work Jesus is doing through his ministry in the body of Jesus Christ. And it's taking time. You know, it's taking us, we're, we're not going to do it in our time and we're not going to do it with our strength or our ability. We're going to do it when God begins to develop that through us. This is his work. We're his workmanship and he will accomplish that in his time, in his way, uh, when it's God's time to do it. And so uh, I just have to say we're in God's time frame. If he wanted this different than the way it was, he would have made it different than what it is. And so the Lord's in charge and we're just trying to be obedient. And as I said before, fit in his, uh, in his purpose. We're trying to fit in his will, fit in his purpose for whatever's going on in the whole wide world. You can be sure God is in, in what's going on in this world right now, this pandemic, not only it, but all of the nations. The, the heart of a king is in his hand he sets up kings and he tears them down. If you want to know whether or not uh, Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden is going to be the next president, I can tell you who it's going to be. It's going to be the one that Jesus puts in position. I hope that, it, I hope that God gives us a man that's for the church. Uh, I hope that God will use that man to give us a little more time I'm hoping that we're not going to, you know, lose ground uh, with with a government that is going to be basically against the church. So, but if it's God's time and it's God's will, then we need to be content with God's will and learn to work in it. And so I accept what the Lord is doing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say something that will be very cross to many people. But I'll tell you that <clears throat> I haven't voted for our president or anybody else since I found this body. 
And I learned that from this body because God sets up kings. God tears them down. You see, I'm in the work of the Lord. I'm not, I'm not in this world. God's going to put in. Now, I know <clears throat> he can use the people, but it's, he'll put it in their minds. He's going to put in whoever he wants in. And if you think this just happens by happen chance, I think you've got a lot to learn about God's, how God operates. He, it's not, <clears throat> it's not going to happen by happen chance. The Lord's in control, especially of the world and the, <clears throat> the leaders of the world. Uh, so somebody said if they knew who the Lord was going to put in, they'd vote for him. But they, they didn't want to vote because they didn't want to, since they didn't know this, afraid they'd vote against the Lord. Doesn't matter who you vote for, God's going to put whoever he wants to put in. I know I know all of the ideology about, you know, doing, you know, man can do so much and God lets man do so much and all that. Well, I'm just going to tell you, it's going to happen the way God wants it to happen. I'm leaving it in his hands. I've got a higher calling than working with the politics of this world. I've been called to the body of Jesus Christ. Now, let me get back to these seven golden candlesticks. These Churches were called candlesticks. They were in a second heaven condition. There was no church in second heaven condition in AD 95. The church had fell away. Uh, look, in, if we go to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, matter of fact, let's just turn there right quick and I'll just quickly mention this, you know, but I'm just trying to give you some things that to help you with a uh, just a foundation of, the beginning of why this book was written and what it's wrote about. Uh, in the 11th chapter, here John says in the first verse, there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without, without the temple, leave it out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they trod underfoot 40 and two months. I don't have time to go into it, but that's 1260 years, prophetically speaking, that's the time frame of those 42 months. Uh, so here, John is told to measure the temple, the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court that's without. So when he's told to measure the temple, he's talking about measuring the holy place and the holy of holies. Why? Well, if I was going to tear down a house and I was going to tell you to build it again, just exactly how I tore it, just exactly what was there before I tore it down, you better get some measurements and you better get the pattern of that house if you're going to build it exactly the way it is, it was. So it had to be measured. It had to be, uh, so it had to be a pattern of how, what were to rebuild. But the court, the outer court, first heaven, leave it alone. It's for the Gentiles to trot underfoot for 42 months. There's a 1260 year period that, that the church was the Gentiles just trod in the outer court. They didn't even, you know, underfoot. They didn't even have all the furniture. I mean, some of that had to be the brazen altar, the laver. That that was all lost, the understanding of it. But the outer court, about all we knew anything about down through the dark age, was, was what could be said about repentance and baptism. And that turned into sprinkling and, and uh, uh, some priest telling you, you know, uh, what to do to get repentance, to either pay a penance or to say our father so many times or are your mother married, you know, count your beads or whatever. You know, there, it was many things was lost back there in those early days. Uh, men trying to figure out how to do whatever the early church had. But all we had was the outer court and we didn't even have it clear. We didn't even have it even close to being clear. But here over in these seven churches, there was a candlestick. They were called candlestick churches. In fact, uh, what, what the Lord told the church at Ephesus, 
and I'll tell you in a minute why I'm bringing this up. Uh, he he told the church in Ephesus. He said, "Let me let me read it to you because I think it'd be better for me to read it than just to say it. Maybe you'll turn there with me and and see it uh, in the second chapter." And he said, he told them to repent. Let me, let me remember, verse five. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. Here, God was gonna remove them. There was still a second heaven condition. There were still people, look at the promise that he said to them in verse seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith of the church and to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a promise to overcomers at the end of every one of these letters. Okay, so I do think it it, it is important uh, to mention these seven letters now and here's why, is because those seven churches and those seven letters to those seven churches were emphatically written to give them what needed to be done so they could overcome and make the bride before it, before the church fell away and the destruction of AD 70. And we're, here we are trying to restore the church and we're not in that second heaven condition, neither have we restored a candlestick condition yet, but we're nearing that. So I think it's good to look at these churches because no doubt we're gonna be in some of the same condition they were in when we first reached that point that we're moving into a restored church, yet we've still got some things that are against us that the Lord wants corrected but yet there's still a candlestick condition, but we're going to need to get closer than just that condition these seven churches were in. We need to get where the early church was and we will. That's what the Lord wants. And so I think it is good to look at the condition of those churches and realize here's some things we can begin to work on because that's what we're going to have to work on right at, right at this these red hairs of this red horse begins to be turn white and righteousness. There's going to be some righteous people that are going to move into a candlestick condition in the early stages of a restored church. And I think if we'll look at these letters, we'll get a greater understanding of what we might need to be working on. And maybe we're getting closer to it than that and why God's stirring that up in my mind and in other men's minds. So, uh, now, I read to you in, in, the ninth, in, in, in the first chapter in the 19th verse that Jesus told him to write the things which are and the things which are hereafter. So after he writes the seven letters to the seven churches, which I'm gonna go over every one of these seven churches with you, because I think it's important. I already went over Ephesus last week concerning doing their first works over. They had left their first love. I talked about getting distracted and, and losing your that first love of loving God and, and your relationship that you found with him and working on that and developing that and having communion with the Lord through the word of God, through prayer, through the spirit that uh, you had uh, a great intimacy with the Lord in your beginning work and your first works, which you were careful to repent of anything that tainted the garment of God working in your life and that the Lord was helping you and that you were staying close enough to God and close enough to the spirit of God that you could feel him uh, when any little thing would displease God. Those are first works that God wants us, and he was telling this church in, of Ephesus to get back to those first works and do them over again. Get, get that intimacy going. Get back to your first love. 
You know, he that keepeth my command, uh, he said, he, Jesus told his father, he said, just as I've kept your commandments and abode in your love, he was praying for his disciples that they would keep his commandments and abide in his love. Well, if you get to where you, you know, you, you let some of these commandments slip. And I, I mentioned last week, you can get caught up in the mechanics of serving God. They're important saints. It's important to understand uh, doctrines. It's important to understand order. It's important to understand behavior or standards. By the way, I want to say something about that. I'm just going to say it and you can chew on it. I believe in righteous standards. But I believe if you are putting a dogmatic standard on the saints of God dictatorially and not letting them learn how to obey the spirit of God, they, those saints will always be babies. You've got to understand. You've got to understand that people walking around with some kind of righteous, you know, what they want to call righteous clothing, and they got a spirit that stinks, they're rotten to the core inside. And you think those outward standards is making them holy? Come on. Saints, come on. If you've got Jesus on the inside in that intimate relationship, you don't have to worry about some kind of law about what pleases God and how you behave and take care of your body. You will be a Christian inside and out. You'll, you will pitch the ark within and without. You won't let sin in and you won't let things of the flesh go out of your life. So men that ride hobby horses like that's got something wrong with them. I'm just shelling down the corn. I'm sorry. I love every one of you. But sometimes a preacher just has to be frank. Now, look. Uh, uh, I, I was going to mention here, and after the seven letters to the seven churches is written, the very first verse in the fourth chapter, after the letters are wrote, which applied back there, applied to that early church, applied, it was before AD 70, they were, they were getting correction and instructions of what they needed to do to finish their course and make the bride. Then in the fourth chapter, after the letters were written, Look what happens, first verse. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The future. The future. After the seven letters. Remember, in the first chapter, he ended that chapter telling him, right, the things which are, they were shortly come to pass. The time was at hand for it. But he said, right, what's, what the things that are and the things which must be here after the future. Right after the seven letters, he, he's given. He hears a trumpet. He hears a message that says, come up here. I'm going to show you what it must be hereafter. And from the fourth chapter to the 22nd chapter is the future from the time that John wrote this concerning what was sealed up that had to be unsealed and showed the future to. No man was able to show that until Jesus got back to heaven and got it from his father. And he sent his angel to signify it to his servant John. But first, let's take care of what must shortly come to pass and what is at hand for these seven churches and those churches that they represent in the body of Christ before it's completely fallen away with the iniquity that was already abounding. What John saw in the fourth chapter, I'd have to go through it, but it's absolutely amazing. John saw the church iniquity come in. He saw, you know, he said, this letter in the fourth chapter of first, his first epistle. 
He said, believe not every spirit for many false prophets have gone out into the world. He, he said before that said, he said, they left, they were not of us or they would still be a part of us. It was showing the iniquity that worked back there that was causing the falling away. He saw the church in its fallen condition. But in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, I'll go through it and explain it to you later. But what it was saying was, what, he, what God showed him was a restored church. It had to be exciting to John to see the pictures. He knew what these symbols represented. To see the host of God round about the temple or the tabernacle. To see uh, the 24 elders that represented the ministry. To see them and to see Christ. I, I just have to go through it. Showing the jasper stone. You know, the firstborn. Uh, that was the stone of Reuben, the firstborn of, of Jacob. The, uh, the uh, Sardis stone, Benjamin, the type of the Gentiles. And the emerald, a, a rainbow of an emerald, the, which emerald was Judas. Jesus was of the tribe of Judas. And here he sees a restored church the saints of God round the throne hollered, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. <laughs> You're worthy, they were saying. My God, here's a host of the body of Christ worshiping and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ for what had been placed in them, not in a fallen away church, but in a glorious church that had been restored. When the 24 elders, the priesthood, which represents this ministry down here restored, when they saw it, they throwed their crowns, their golden crowns at the feet of Jesus and began to cry, thou art worthy. <laughs> because they saw the saints got what was placed in their gifts to give them and they got it and they had the worship of the New Testament divine order of God. He starts the thing off seeing a restored church. Okay, but then in the fifth chapter, and I'm just gonna say this, I'm gonna quit, but look look at the very first verse of the fifth, fifth chapter. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. You gotta know that's the word of God. And on the backside, what's on the backside? It's what followed what was in the book. The book of Revelation is wrote on the backside. Everything else was written back there, but what followed them was written in the book of Revelation for the future for us. Sealed with seven seals. It's locked up. Nobody knew it. Nobody could tell it. But Jesus, nobody on the earth and nobody under the earth, nobody that had died, nobody living had the revelation. But Jesus was the one that was in heaven he got the revelation from his father and he sent to tell it to his servant, John. Let's, let's take care of what's got to be took care of for right now that's going to happen to these seven churches and the churches and the body of Christ in Asia. And then, John, I'm going to show you the future because I'm going to open this book up at some point before the falling away, of the before the restoration of the church to help my people understand the direction that they're going to need at that time. Saints is getting close to that time. So, anyway, that's sort of an introduction, maybe. Uh, I'm sorry if it, it bores you, but it's the things that God's put on my heart. Sometimes people think, well, I don't want to hear about all that. Well, you need to hear about it. It has to do with the future, and you need to understand the why. To understand, you've got to know why. You've got to know who, what, when, where, and why of the writings of the word of God. It applies to our day saints. It's important for you to get it in your understanding. Pray for me that God will help me to at least get it. I'm gonna to try to get it in audio form first, maybe. And then maybe I can get it in written form before I leave this world. I'm, I'm hoping for many years, so don't think that I'm 
I'm not prophesying anything doing away with me. My wife needs me right now. <laughs> I just said that because she's listening. But I need her worse than she needs me. So I'm, 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 you know, thank God she's a healthy woman. And the Lord knows I need her. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Remember this. Pray for Brother Bobby Boyd in, in uh, Mississippi. He's having a triple bypass I hear tomorrow. He's going to be on my prayer list. He is on my prayer list. Let's pray. God will watch over him and help him through that time. Uh, pray for Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas. Uh, you know, he's in, enduring this cancer. Uh, his numbers has been coming up. The last report I got was from him directly. He's feeling better. He said his numbers were coming up. Feelings coming back in his legs some. He's walking on a walker, not in a wheelchair all the time. And so uh, God bless his heart. Keep him in your prayers. We're praying for him oft. Saints in the Little Rock Church, we will have church Sunday morning at 1130. And, uh, you know, we're not going to be having breakfast or Bible study yet not at this time, and we'll see Sunday about uh, going back when we're going to start back up on our Wednesday night services right now. I plan on continuing these Thursday night Bible studies. God bless your hearts. I love you all, and uh, pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Pray for Brother McNabb, also in Keswick, Canada. He's really suffering. He's got several illnesses in his body, uh, he's got gallbladder trouble, but he, he, his liver's not working. If he had his gallbladder took out, they tell him he wouldn't live. And so it's just nick and tuck and, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult time for him. Let's pray God will touch his body. Pray for that. Pray for the body of Jesus Christ. Pray for our government, our leaders. The Bible tells us to do that. Uh, and look, keep looking up. You're one of God's children. He knows exactly where you are. You know, one of the things that he told the church at, at Smyrna, he told that church, my God, what a terrible time. He said, look, some of you are going to get thrown in jail. Some of you are going to suffer for 10 days. That seemed to be pretty specific. Not, I'm not thinking that is uh, symbolic. He said, be faithful unto death and I'll bless you. Dear Lord, he wasn't going to remove that from them. Whatever you go through, saints, look at this. God will go through it. He'll give you strength where there is no strength. He'll be with you no matter what you have to go through in life. But just keep looking up. There is no there is no safe place outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your affection towards him. Work on your first works. Work on your first love. God bless your hearts. I'll see you. Those of you that are in church here, I'll see you Sunday morning at 1130. Those of you that are watching us from afar off, God bless your hearts. Good to see you, Brother Fide. Uh, the ones in the Dominican Republic, God bless your hearts. Good to see you, Sister Janique, on here. Um, anyway, this will be posted on Facebook and on our website and on YouTube, so you can watch it and listen to it again. And, uh, you know, we're, you're more than welcome to do that. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Uh, for those of you that are not local here, I'll be back on here next Thursday at 7 p.m. God bless you and have a good night.